Yeah, we're at a crossroads. We're at a crossroads here. We, we have the wherewithal now to create technology that would actually help the entire human race. The question is, will we do it? But we can do it now. My name is Rick Willard. I am the founder of Agentic Group, which is based in New York City. We are a sustainability platform for the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, we have a federated membership of over 40 companies around the world that focus uh, on blockchain technology specifically or are looking to uh, somehow get into the blockchain space. I got involved with blockchain through digital currencies, through, through Bitcoin. A friend of mine uh, introduced me to Bitcoin in 2012, and I thought it was interesting. Uh, and like everybody, I just took me a few months to wrap my head around it. Uh, and then uh, we had a think tank. I founded a, co-founded a think tank called Mint Combine in New York City. And we spent two years uh, trying to understand this space and, and what, it, what it really meant. You know, and we found out that it meant a lot more than just another digital currency. It actually, uh, as the blockchain became more influential in our thinking, we began to realize that it was a profound shift in how the internet could be used to create new forms of value and how it could be used to enfranchise you know, and include people in global finance. There are communities that make things or communities that think things or say things or write things, and they're all distributed over the internet. So borders matter less, nations matter less, but communities of people matter more and humans matter more. So that for me was the point of no return. When I found it actually uh, being an issue about not only the hu human nature, but humanity moving forward in the 21st century, then I was completely hooked. And it was something that I felt that I had to do. Not, just, not something that I just wanted to do. I, I felt I needed to be a part of this. We would talk with lots of CEOs and lots of CTOs and CMOs and say, you know, here's Bitcoin, here are digital assets, here's this blockchain thing, you know, underlying all of it. What do you think? And then we'd listen. And we would get some really disturbing responses because we, had come, we came to realize over time that what we were doing when we attacked the value of what, uh, rather the notion of what value means to an individual, it's very subjective, right? Value to me, something may have value, it may not have value to someone else. So when we talk about value, all of a sudden we realize that we were actually attacking the values of that individual we were talking to or the values of that corporation that we were meeting with or the corporate culture rather. And so not just from a business standpoint, is it hard to execute blockchains and how to, to, to move the internal needle forward, but from a very visceral level, in human beings, it's hard to move that value needle forward because we're so used to the system the way it is. We're so used to banks acting the way that they act. Uh, so much so that we actually can't visualize any other way of doing things. But I think that the long tail of, of uh, recessions that we are now involved in and we're going to see more and more around the world as as the world restructures itself um, moving forward are going to make it easier and easier uh, and more obvious that things like trust and security online moving value online is where we need to go blockchains don't cure cancer right um, however they do some things very very well that allow the internet to act in a way that is beneficial. Uh, blockchains solve some very basic uh, needs for distributed finance. One of them is trust. Through smart contracts, we can actually build trust networks so that people in a peer-to-peer -peer environment 
can trade back and forth with some level of assurance that the person they're dealing with is, or the group they're dealing with, or the company they're dealing with, ha has a good reputation. Uh, and that reputation, you know, can it might change, and the, the information about them will change on the blockchain, but it won't be tampered with. And that has implications for one's own identity as well. So if you can definitively say that you are speaking with Rick and you're transacting with Rick and my identity and my reputation is embedded in a blockchain that is then you know, talking with a blockchain that yours is on, then we can have a, a trust relationship without really having ever met each other or having done business at all with each other. I think that's fundamental, one of the fundamental things. Security is another. Um, blockchains are military-grade cryptology, and they've never been cracked. It, it isn't, when you hear about hack, hackers you know, stealing Bitcoin or whatever, they're not stealing from the blockchain itself. They are stealing at the point of entry, at the wallet level or at the browser level and they intercept those messages, but the blockchain itself is, is very secure. We as humans are going to have to make a choice about how we want to live. Do we really want to you know, live in this closed environment where everybody's a nemesis and people who don't look like you are bad people by definition? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when we're just at the edge of something a lot more glorious that I think humans have inherently been striving towards ever since the dawn of thought, which is we're all just one people. So why do we need these banks? Why do we, and I, we won't get into the broader you know, question of nation states, but, but you know, I, let's just say that we need nation states for now. And it, it serves a function for people to, to belong. Okay. But who I deal with and who I do business with and who I like as a person or want to trade money with or value, that should have no border. It simply should have no border. Yes, we have to deal with issues like AML and KYC because there are people out there blowing things up and there are people using money, but they're going to use that anyway. I mean, that's been happening way before the internet, right? People moving cash around for, for bad things, for anything from child trafficking to drugs to whatever. So nothing's changed that way. Bitcoin is, or digital you know, value is not some monster that unleashed all of this stuff. It's just allowing people to do things a little quicker uh, and without the, uh, the input of gatekeepers that basically charge you rent for moving your own money. And I think that that's, you know, those, those days need to be over. I think that most of the banks, especially the banks, who have the most to lose out of all of this, um, have up to this point tried to make um, their own processes more efficient through blockchains, and they've internalized it, you know, dealing with groups like R3, et cetera, and say, okay, how do we do faster clearance? Uh, how do we get to T0? How do we do all of these other things? Okay, that's, that's fine, but, but it doesn't address the real issue about the banking system that is broken well beyond, you know, all reason. And those, there are some banks that are starting to get it and say, well, okay, maybe we need to do a pivot here. Maybe we should embrace, but there, there are very few of them, that we should embrace this for what it is, a peer-to-peer -peer movement. Maybe we should step away and try to do value add somewhere else to keep our brand relevant. And I think that those banks that take that, that track and that uh, sort of idea and say, we're gonna move this way, we're gonna move with it, not against it, are gonna find themselves in a great position in several years. Those banks that resist it and continue to fight it are gonna find themselves in something less tenable, a position that's simply less tenable. Um, now again, certain banks do different things too, right? If you are a, trade finance institution, like specifically, then blockchain will help you right away. It will help create massive, massive efficiencies within that, that trade finance ecosystem. Uh, so you can do business as usual, kind of, and just better. But retail banks or commercial banks, they're, they're going to have a hard time 
dealing with this and they're going to have to adjust. It, it won't be a question of do they want to at, one, at some point in the future. It'll be a question of when are you going to do it because it's, it's your livelihood at stake. There are almost 3 billion unbanked people in the world. They right now have smart, uh, not smartphones, but feature phones, dumb phones, people call them. Pretty soon, when smartphones can be had for less than $5 each, which is right around the corner, nearly every person living in poverty on earth will have access to a smartphone and be connected to a network. That is game-changing in and of itself. When you have digital wallets on these phones and you have the ability to trade assets, we're going to find, we're going to answer that question, what happens when everybody has money? Because capitalism itself has thrived in some areas by the natural exclusion of others from markets. It actually uses that scarcity principle as its driving basis. So what happens when money is not scarce? And you see in an analog sense, the Netherlands and other countries, of Dubai, you know, they have a guaranteed income for people. That, that's just the beginning of all, all this mindset is moving towards the same place. You know, we don't have to have people who are poor and hungry and without shoes. We, we don't have to have any of that. We don't have to have people who are living in squalor and, and simply, you know, fighting for a handful of rice every day. We, we, there, there's too much. There's too much in the world uh, to live like that anymore. And I think that certain countries... I think even certain corporations are beginning to understand that. And certainly this movement, this blockchain movement, is the technology underpinning, uh, the, the technology part of that mindset which exists offline as well. And we're at the point where we can do it. So I, I think that uh, I'm very high on humanity right now. I think that, that we have a shared interest in reducing climate change, we have a shared interest in making cleaner water, and we can do it. We have the technology to do it. We have a shared interest in working with people across borders or sharing money and sharing value with people across borders. Uh, and I think that you know, we're growing up, most of us anyway. We need to stop just talking about what can be done and not just build what can be done, but implement what can be done. And I think once we get to the stage of action, then th that's what I hope for all of us, is that we actually implement these things and not just keep them on the shelf. Because again, you know, capital, uh, as we've known it over the past 800, 900 years or so, uh, really does not like, it likes a certain amount of competition, but not a whole lot of competition. It really hates egalitarianism to a large degree. Um, but we're coming to a point where the world is going to be sharing all these resources. Uh, so I hope that we as people can be expansive enough to, to get over ourselves and to actually make a change for once a real change.